Hello lovely people, my name is Emma and today I'm filming my December reading wrap up for everything I read um, at the last month of 2020. So I had a really good reading month at the end of the year which was awesome, um, having some time off over Christmas really helped with that. So I'm going to split this into fiction and non-fiction, um, non-fiction is going to go second and I have a few DNFs that I'm going to be chucking in the non-fiction area. So the first two fiction books that I finished was book two and book three of the Exogenesis series by Octavia E. Butler and this is called Adult Rights and Imago. I listened to both of them on audiobook. Um, the Exogenesis trilogy, that is very hard to say, um, is about, it's like a sci-fi epic where the world has gone completely to shit um, due to like nuclear war. And this alien species came along, scooped up a bunch of humans and then kind of kept them in a cryogenic state and then slowly awoke some of them to then kind of interact with the aliens. And we follow Lilith who has become almost like a spokesperson for the human race who is learning about the alien species and their kind of, um, their customs, their ways, and then about the trade-off that they want to do and their desire to try and repopulate the earth with humans but what kind of um, cost they insist on for that. Book two and book three actually follow slightly different characters of which I won't say who they are because I don't want to spoil stuff from book one. It definitely explores um, what it means to be human and what it means to kind of remain pure in very different ways and I also think book three was really interesting looking at like family units and kind of gender and what is sort of important within relationships. Um, I think it's a really really strong very interesting sci-fi series. My only criticism is I wanted it to be a little bit longer and I was slightly less compelled by book three just because I didn't enjoy the character who is kind of our main narrator in book three anywhere near as much and um, they felt almost too alien to be able to really empathize with them. I won't go into too much more detail other than that because I don't want to spoil anything book two and book three but I would say it's a really like it, I would definitely recommend it if you're a sci-fi fan. The next book that I finished is The Dreamers by Karen Wallace Thompson. This is a YA post-apocalyptic book where there is a disease that starts to um, cause people to fall asleep and then you can't wake them back up and it's focused on this particular town where um this disease kind of starts springs up and starts to spread and then it follows a variety of different characters and looking at how the US reacts to this town. It was obviously kind of very poignant because of everything that's happened in 2020 but to be honest I didn't actually enjoy the book that much. Um, I think it was trying to go for the like quiet beauty of the world and like what is truly important and it reminded me in some ways of something like Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. However for me it was far too on the nose with everything that it was doing and it was really trying way too hard. I didn't find any of the characters particularly compelling, I didn't really care and I didn't think the story particularly went anywhere and everything was very like forced and upfront and in your face about like I'm making a beautiful and poignant statement about life, pay attention to it kind of a way that I just didn't really appreciate so uh, it was not a favourite for me. The next one that I read was Take a Hint Danny Brown by Talia Hibbert. It. This is a contemporary romance and it's like a fake dating trope and I had such a good time with it. So it's where um, our heroine um, ends up being rescued from a building that may or may not be on fire by um, the security guard who works there who she's kind of got a good like um, banterous relationship with and then this actually ends up being captured in a viral video that um, in a video that goes viral across social media and they become like the hot new it couple for a while even though they're not actually dating. So they end up end doing like a fake dating thing to help out some Thing that he is working on um, which gets him this attention and it's a whole conversation about like social media and online presence and kind of the virality of moments um, and then also them growing together and is this fake dating going to become real or not. I love a good fake dating trope, I think that they can be done very badly but I really enjoyed this one and I definitely enjoyed our two main characters. Um, there was some really interesting anxiety rep in, a, in the book that I appreciated. Um, one thing that I didn't find overly compelling was the heroine was a little bit too blunt with her like meta-analysis of her own emotions so it felt a little bit again like on the nose and um, too explicit for me. Not for the sex scenes but like for kind of how she was feeling. Um, it felt like people don't really talk like that about their own feelings but you know whatever. Um, but generally I had a good time and I really enjoyed Talia Hibbert. This was like book two in her like the Brown Sisters series. The first one is Get a Life Chloe Brown that I also really enjoyed and I definitely want to pick up the last one or the next one which is something to do with Eve Brown and I can't remember what she does. No, no idea. Um, but I definitely want to pick that up soon. The next book that I finished is The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas. This book has been hanging over my head for months. I started it in October and I finally finished it towards the end of December. 
um, it was fine, like I had a fairly good time but I think starting a new job in the middle definitely didn't help it because I kind of left it alone for weeks on end. Um, it's kind of a raucous political action packed book looking at the machinations between England and France within whatever historical time period it's at and I can't remember off the top of my head now. Um, I enjoyed the main characters and I enjoyed all the different kind of shenanigans they got into um, but it definitely was too drawn out for me and there were big chunks of it where I just wasn't that bothered or interested which is kind of a hallmark of Alexander Dumas for me. Um, it is a tighter story than The Count of Monte Cristo, I will give him that, but it's still like 600 plus pages long, so a tighter story might be a very subjective term here. I'm pleased I've read it and I think it is worth a read if you have the time, but um, I don't think it's it's never going to land on any like favourites classics from me shall we say. The next book I finished is Written in the Stars by Alexandria Belfure. This is another contemporary romance, was a total spur of the moment Kindle purchase and I had such a good time with it. It's a lesbian romance which again follows a fake dating trope because apparently I have a favourite trope in my contemporary romances and it's about two women who go on a date that's been set up as a blind date um, by somebody that they kind of both mutually know. It goes terribly but then one of them tells um, the guy who set them up that it went quite well mainly just to get him off her back so that he stops setting her up with people and then basically they have to continue the charade that it went quite well for a while and in doing so feelings ensue. The thing I really enjoyed about this rom-com as well was on contemporary romance was that it was a real opposites attract story. One of the women is a very like um, she's super into astrology and spirituality and she's a real like free spirit um, and because of that she often isn't taken very seriously in her life whereas the other one is an actuary who is very very like um, straight lace and boring and kind of a bit of a control freak and it's about both of them kind of taking on the attributes of the other. What I also really appreciated about this book was the act three breakup that happens in every kind of contemporary romance before they inevitably have their happy ending actually felt more real this time. Most of the act threes for me hinge on miscommunications and misconceptions that just like wouldn't actually break up a couple and it's just overly dramatic at the end to try and force this like classic act three thing. Whereas this one felt a lot more real and was a kind of conversation coming to a head that kind of made sense had been set up from the beginning and then felt like their kind of actual resolution at the end felt more genuine and like there was more kind of emotional growth from both characters within it. So I really really enjoyed it. I thought it was lovely. The next book I finished is The Familiars by Stacey Hall. This is a historical fiction set in the 1700s and is about a woman who um, is struggling with childbirth and reaches out to a local midwife slash medicine woman to help her out. However the midwife then gets embroiled in um, the witch trials that are happening around the time. It's uh, written in the time of James I which was a big time in the UK where witch trials were really at their height and it is loosely based around the Pendle witch trials and the author did a lot of research in that area to kind of base a lot of what was happening here some of the characters I believe were actually real people and share the same name. Generally I had a good time with this one, it's kind of a classic gothic thriller vibe. I really enjoy historical fiction that has these sorts of elements to them and kind of mentions the sort of mystic in some sort of way. It's not my favourite out there, it was just kind of a good time but not a great time and I think it was because I found the main, um, one of the main characters quite irritating from the beginning, although I did appreciate the story arc that she then end ended up going on. I think if you are a fan of historical fiction in general, totally check this one out. I did enjoy a lot of the information about witch trials in the time period. I just read a book on witches, um, literally this particular kind of era of witch trials a couple of months back called Witches by Tracy Borman and I think that this would be a great partner book to go with it as you have the kind of non-fiction and the fiction um, and it is always nice to read historical fiction that isn't from like Victorian era or more modern than that so I did appreciate it for that fact. The next fiction that I read is Wicked Fox by Kate Cho. This is a paranormal romance and it turns out it's actually a YA paranormal romance and I think that's what let it down for me. It's um, a based on Korean folklore and our main female character is a gamiho which um, is basically like a fox spirit who has to devour the livers of men and kind of their energy to um, exist. It's about her grappling with this side of her compared to her human side and then she gets embroiled in a very elaborate uh, scheme with a boy at her school. I enjoyed the first half of the book I thought it was quite well paced and I was like I liked where we were going and then there was a big climactic moment about 50% of the way through which felt like it should have been actually more the end of the book and then we kind of continued for another half of the book with sort of very meandering messy 
badly paced section that I just didn't really understand what we were doing or why we were here and then I didn't enjoy what ended up actually being the climax. It's a shame because I liked both of the characters and I enjoyed their interactions. I also really enjoyed the Korean mythology side of things and I liked the fact that the paranormal creature in this one was the girl rather than the boy because it kind of played around with the classic like men are physically stronger tropes that you so often see in paranormal romance. So in general I don't think I'm going to be continuing the series but it was nice to jump back in with paranormal romance and I might check out some more in the future. I just don't think this was quite the right one and I definitely liked all the different kinds of mythology. And then the final fiction that I read is Defy the Stars by Claudia Gray. This was technically on my January TBR but I just got kind of keen and ended up reading it uh, a couple of weeks earlier than I'd intended. Um, this is an epic sci-fi series and it is in a uh, world where Earth is battling um, with another planet and it's based on kind of their beliefs to do with technology, specifically artificial intelligence. Our heroine is from the a planet that does not approve of artificial intelligence and then she stumbles across um, a an abandoned AI who it turns out may be more than what he seems and may have um, intelligence that goes beyond just the artificial. There's this all very very elaborate plot that they're kind of racing on this sort of quest idea that they're doing so that she can gain a particular tactical advantage for her side in the war and he is helping her along with that but it really is also an exploration of their relationship and whether or not he definitely counts as like a person. Um, I love artificial intelligence books, I love conversations about personhood and what does it mean and like what makes us distinct from robots and like all that kind of jazz, it's, it's right up my street so I really really enjoyed this, I loved the world building, I loved all the side characters, I had such a good time and I'm definitely going to continue with the series. I also found it remarkably quick to read, it's like a 500 plus page book but I kind of blitzed it in like a week and a half if that so um I was quite pleasantly surprised at how much easier it was to get through than I was expecting so yeah really good fun totally check it out if you like sci-fi or you like robots Okay, that is fiction down. Let's talk about non-fiction, shall we? <laughs> the first non-fiction that I finished is Queer Intentions by Amelia Abraham. This is a, a personal journey through LGBTQ plus culture. Amelia Abraham is a journalist who has written a lot about queer culture and this is a collection of not quite distinct essays but kind of each individual chapter takes on a different topic and it is looking at essentially the through line is when you have a group of people who have been marginalised historically and then we reach a stage where they're being less marginalised when that community comes into more of the kind of so-called mainstream does that community lose something by being more accepted and um, is it worth what is being lost? So it's looking at things like um, the kind of number of gay bars that are closing because um, the need for queer only spaces is potentially less. It's looking at things like the commodification of drag queens with RuPaul's Drag Race and also kind of pride and the various sort of conversations about how pride should be handled, companies jumping on board with that kind of thing. It's looking at gay marriage and whether that is something which um, should a non-heteronormative couple even want to strive towards that and just generally it's a big conversation about where the LGBTQ plus community is now compared to where they've come from and what does it even really mean anymore. This was such a good book, it was such an incredible read. I love Amelia Abraham's style, um, there's a few kind of memoir elements threaded through as well which I really appreciated. You can tell that she's a journalist and that she kind of writes for a living, um, it was very easy to read, it had a real like lovely pace to it and it was generally such interesting conversations that um, I spent a lot of time talking with my friends actually about a lot of the stuff that I was reading in here. Um, and I really kind of appreciated a lot of the discussion that was happening. It was um, so much kind of food for thought in different ways. And I enjoyed the fact that, you know, I've been reading a little bit more about LGBTQ plus kind of history this year but this was one that was brought into more of a modern day context. The next book that I finished is A Forger's Tale by Sean Greenhalgh. This is The Confessions of the Bolton Forger. So Sean Greenhalgh actually is an art forger, he spent four years in prison for um, his crimes of forging various uh, ancient artefacts and antiquities and um, artwork in the various the styles kind of various masters and it's a conversation about how he got caught and the trial but also how he ended up getting to this point and really is a memoir of his kind of early child sorry late childhood all the way through to when he ends up going to prison. Now you can tell that Sean is not actually a writer by trade, he definitely um, has a quite clunky writing style and he would have some tangents that I really just didn't care about, plus some kind of politically incorrect 
frankly strange things that he would talk about from time to time but if you can look past that he is a man who knows an incredible amount of our, about art history and also the techniques used and he goes into such amazing detail about how he did the various things that he did and for somebody who has had no formal training in this area he really is an example of like a lifelong learner and just it was incredible to learn about kind of the the amount of of information he had the amount of skills he had and how he kind of used them he also has a lot of very interesting assumptions about what he considers to be art and what isn't. He considers everything that he did to actually be trade rather than art because he was only mimicking rather than kind of creating in his own right. And as somebody who is interested in like philosophy of art um, and what it, what does something mean to be art and kind of especially in a modern context where you've got all sorts of performance arts and things like that. Um, I found a lot of his underlying uh, assumptions very interesting and definitely kind of had me thinking a lot of things. So I don't know if he intended that to be a through line, but it was one that I was definitely picking up on. I think if you're a fan of art history, this is a must read. It was really fascinating. And also if you're a fan of kind of like antiques and antiquity, I think this one's really good as well. It wasn't just paintings that he did. He had sculptures, he had bronze work. He was working with metals and clay. Generally a very um, talented individual and fascinating in general. The next nonfiction that I finished is Fabulosa the story of Polare, Britain's secret gay language by Paul Baker. This book was really fantastic to read on the heels of reading Queer Intentions because it really is a microcosm of everything that Queer Intentions was discussing. Polari sprung up in the 1930s to 1950s in Britain and was a secret language that the gay community would use to be able to talk openly um, and in public about their various kind of liaisons without giving themselves away and therefore suffering persecution. However, as the kind of gay community became potentially more accepted and the sort of narrative around what it meant to be gay in Britain changed, and also as how mainstream culture co-opted a lot of the language, it fell into disuse. And this book is really charting its um, sort of introduction, its various um, influences and origins, and then also its kind of common use, and then basically its downfall, um, and where is it now and who uses it now. Paul Baker has made his entire living off of Polari. It was his PhD subject as a young academic and he's been to many talks and this book is basically a reworking of his PhD thesis into something that is more accessible to age kind of the general public and also bringing it to a more modern context with more information that he's learned since his PhD days. It's a fantastic read, I loved his writing style. It's an incredibly interesting topic, both from LGBTQ plus history, but also from like a linguistic side of things, and also kind of a snapshot of British history in general, and of kind of British pop culture in general. Absolutely amazing, and if you're a fan of Kenneth Williams, you totally need to read it. Um, but yeah, generally, I had a great time. It's a boner book. The last non-fiction that I finished is What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Fat by Aubrey Gordon. This is an incredible non-fiction book, it's quite short, and it's looking at the anti-fat bias that is rampant within Western culture. Well, it focuses on Western, it's probably a global thing. Aubrey Gordon is known on the internet as your fat friend, and she's written very extensively about anti-fat bias across a variety of different mediums. She has a podcast called Maintenance Phase with Michael Hobbs, which is looking at the weight loss industry and the various kind of scams, misconceptions perceptions and problems within it and this book is looking at the systematic harm that is done to fat people due to anti-fat bias across a variety of different areas. Now it is not a book that is talking about body positivity and about how to love yourself a bit more if you happen to be on the chubbier side, it is about the real harm that is done to fat people due to the fact that our society has a tendency of conflating health with weight and also morality with health and just the all sorts of problems that are wrapped up and kind of the, the real kind of decades long issue that we've had with health, nutrition and weight loss in general. Now I do think it's an amazing, like it's a very important book and it's a really great starting point but I do think that Aubrey Gordon needed to include more science in it for me. Um, there were a few points where she made a few statements that as somebody who has read a lot of her work, listens to maintenance phase, is generally kind of aware of the fitness industry, having worked in it as a personal trainer for a while, is interested in nutrition in general kind of thing. Um, there were a few statements she made where I'd be like, yes, I know where you're coming from and I know why you're saying that. But I think if you didn't have that background, a few of her statements would be a little bit like, well, I don't know that that's true and where is your proof? And I think given the kind of prevalence of anti-fat bias and the... Um, kind of acceptance that we have of all sorts of actually quite fallible and untrue statements about nutrition and health and kind of fitness she needed more information to kind of bulk these out to convert more people basically um i do think it's one that i would per 
personally suggest reading it alongside listening to Maintenance Phase because a few of the episodes that she does in Maintenance Phase expand on information in the book. For example, things like Fen Fen, which is a weight loss drug that was very popular in, I think, the 80s. I could be wrong about the date there, either late 80s or early 90s. Um, it's one that the book briefly touches on, but she has a podcast episode that goes into way more detail about it. However, it is an incredible read and is such an important conversation, especially around this time of the year where we're going to get all that kind of January New Year's resolution nonsense. And yeah, it's just, it's something which I think more people need to talk about and it's a very important book. Now, I did actually DNF two books, uh, two non-fictions, and I'm going to talk about them briefly because I did mention them in my December TBR, so I wanted to let you know I got to them and I'm not going to finish them. One of those is The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat by Oliver Sacks. This is a book written in the 1980s and it is a psychology book. Oliver Sacks was a noted psychologist at the time and it's kind of a collection of different quirky stories of people kind of patients that he met that had a variety of different um, sort of mental disorders that kind of presented in different ways. My problem with this book was it really didn't go into much information about why these people had what they had or how they were going to treat it or where they ended up going on. It really was just a series of quite short vignettes of like, huh, this person's brain does weird stuff and then we moved on. And I just feel like that's something which doesn't really have a place in kind of today's conversations about mental health. Um, it felt very dated and of its time and if I'm going to read something like this I want there to be a bit more kind of meat to each individual um, example rather than just look at the weird person over there who can't recognise his own wife. And then the other non-fiction that I DNF'd is Traces by Patricia Wiltshire. This is the memoir of leading forensic scientist and criminal investigator Patricia Walsh Patricia Wiltshire is a forensic ecologist, which means that she looks at plant matter, pollen, dirt, things like that on either victims or kind of evidence to help to create a timeline for where various kind of things to do with the crime may have taken place. Now I got about 50 pages into this book and Patricia does two things that I really don't like in non-fiction which is exactly why I'm no longer finishing it. The first is she has a tendency to uh, assume that her field of inquiry is the most interesting, most important, least fallible area that there could possibly be. She was very keen to toot her own horn about how good she was at her job and how important what she does is and I don't mind that so much but like all forensic evidence is problematic in its own right, how it gets used is problematic, and actually no one area of science is completely infallible, nor is any one area of science better than any other, and the kind of rhetoric of pitting non-fiction subjects against each other is one that I never enjoy in any non-fiction, and she really went for it in this one. She also was really going for quite sensationalist language when talking about the various crimes. I think I read two, and there was just a a voyeuristic relish that I did not appreciate and it's something that I really struggle with in true crime. I find that the tone of true crime has to be so sensitive and careful with, with something that I read because I really don't like it when we kind of dramatise and sensationalise the killer. And there was a particular statement where she was talking about like looking down her microscope and being able to pinpoint like where the killer took the body and where the woman will have gasped her last breath or something like that and it just made my skin crawl and it's just it's not it's if you're a fan of true crime power to you but it's something that I can't do so yeah that's why we're not finishing that one so that is it from me that was the uh my final month of reading in December I have four books on the go that are taking me through into the new year but I'm not going to talk about them because oh my god this video has been a bit long already and I have more things I need to film so have you read any of these are any of them on your tbr are any of them coming off your tbr because of what i've said i'm always interested when i find out that i put somebody off a book um so yeah do let me know in the comments down below i hope you had a good holiday season in general and i'm wishing you a very good 2021 bye